we're going to try and touch on um, focusing on now that you've had uterine cancer, where do you go from here? Um, and I also am going to apologize because I might have changed my slides significantly from the copies that you have. I'm happy to send them out to anyone and Dina will help get them because I have a lot more information in here um, than you got. I might have been a little bit tardy um, with my slides. Okay. So we're going to talk about endometrial cancer background, but not really. I think you guys ha could probably pass the boards in terms of endometrial cancer, how you get it, all of that. So we're going to gloss over that a little bit. But I'm going to focus on a little bit about two groups of folks that are higher risk that you already know about, the genetic as well as the obesity, and how you as a consumer and a person who's been affected by that can impact other women um, both in your family and out of your family. And then we're going to talk about now that you've survived endometrial cancer, what can you do going forward to ensure your health and longevity? Apparently that button doesn't do anything. Hold on, let's try this one. Okay. Um, I have no financial disclosures, but would love to entertain some. Um, so if anyone has, you know, I'm, I'm happy to take money for things. Um, well, not everything, but um, acknowledgments. Um, we, all right, no laughing up there. Um, I do need to, we all as researchers build on the work of other folks in our field. And I would be remiss in not recognizing some of the work that has enabled me to focus my research on both high risk and obesity. Um, and that's Dr. Vivian von Grunigen, who's actually at next door doing some talks, or she may be doing one later here. Dr. Amanda Nichols Fader, Dr. Carolyn Muller, and Dr. Peter Hallowell, who you wouldn't know because he's a bariatric surgeon, um, but he and I work very closely together. You guys know this already, we're going to skip that. We also know that I'm going to focus primarily on endometrial cancer as opposed to the sarcomas um, because that's the majority of folks and also uh, what we can impact a little bit more. Um, and again, as we've talked about, most women present early, um, early stage, cured most of the time, but some of the things that make you higher risk for developing endometrial cancer also set the stage for some other diseases that we're going to talk about. Um, does this have a... Oh, yeah. It's a little scary when you get the laser pointer, but I promise not to point it out there. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about Lynch syndrome, obesity, and these other ones a little bit. One thing I don't know that we've really stressed about diabetes is that it's both type 1 and type 2. We think sugar may actually be a carcinogenic agent, which is very sad to me because Halloween is my absolute favorite holiday. Um, I think it should be a national holiday, personally. Um, but anyway, sugar and our access to it is really um, a huge problem for our country. And so you know, again, already all about the two types of endometrial cancer, the type 1 and the type 2. Um, we treat them with uh, surgery, okay? The issue is that we've looked at women who've been diagnosed with endometrial cancer. Is this a teachable moment? Can we talk about some of the things that impact both the cancer, the chance of recurrence, um, and lifestyle factors that we can influence? And I will be the first to admit that we as physicians don't do a good job of this. Okay, um, and that's something that we really need to focus on, that most women do not die of endometrial cancer. They die of obesity-related complications for certain groups, um, and so we really need to focus on that as part of the survivorship program. So what is a survivor? Um, I didn't make up these definitions. Um, these are from the NCI, but a survivor is an individual um, from the time of their diagnosis through the balance of their life. But let's remember, survivors are not just about the person with cancer. It's a part about all the women and the men that went through that journey with you because cancer doesn't just impact the individual, it impacts the entire community. Um, and look at what's happened with the number of cancer survivors in the U.S., okay? We started off here at 3 million. We're now up to here 12 million cancer survivors in the United States. And so, again, we're, we're focusing on a pretty large group of women and men. I always forget about the men, and I'm sorry for the guys in the audience, um, but I, I forget. Um, and if we look at the age of the cancer survivors, the biggest group is this 65 and over. The next biggest group is 40 to 64. Very, very few young folks um, with endometrial, not endometrial cancer, but any cancers in general. And so the lifestyle and the diseases that impact these groups are going to be um, pretty similar. So you're a uterine cancer survivor. What can you focus on next? And I'm, I'm saddened. I put Angelina Jolie up here because she's been in the news a lot. And there have been a lot of very um, visible women with ovarian cancer. We have not had that same luck in uterine cancer, and there has not been that same focus on uterine cancer. And I feel like, in some ways, we really need to raise awareness for that. Um, 
and I'm not suggesting any of you volunteer to do that, but uh, it is something that we need to talk about. And so we're going to focus on genetics, obesity, and then a little bit on quality of life. So all cancers are genetic, okay? It's an amazing that we don't get more problems with cancer. So what happens in cancer, you know, Dr. Hamilton already talked about, you have something go awry with your body's ability to stop growing, okay? And so if you have an inherited cancer, you start off already with an error. So it takes less time for other errors to develop and then develop into a cancer. So folks that have a hereditary genetic or genetic component to it will develop the cancers usually younger than the folks that do not have a genetic component. But all cancers are caused by problems um, in your genes. And so what are the clues that you or someone that you know might be affected by hereditary syndrome? Well, first of all, early age of cancer diagnosis in under 50s younger every day. Um, in my view. Um, if you have related cancers and more than two members of the family now, remember you have to consider mom and dad's side of the family separately, okay? And don't forget, and I have sometimes this is forgotten, that you can get a predisposition to a female cancer from your dad's side, okay? And there are surprisingly a lot of people, both lay people and physicians, that forget to ask about dad, okay? So you really have got to look at both sides of the family tree. And we look um, from some specific combinations of cancers that give us a clue about certain genetic predisposition. For example, breast and ovarian cancer, or the BRCA uh, mutations, BR for breast, CA for cancer. Breast cancer gets all the press, but really ovarian cancer is a big uh, issue with this as well. Then we have the Lynch syndrome. It's also called hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer, HNPCC. Um, and then there's Cowden's, which is breast, uterine, and can have thyroid. So there are a lot of different syndromes in there, and we're not going to talk about all of them, just the main ones. And so if you have a, one person that has multiple cancers, for example, uterine cancer and ovarian cancer at the same time, it's when you think of that this could possibly be genetic. So Lynch syndrome, about 2 to 5 percent of all endometrial cancer. Um, you only need to have one mutation. You don't need to have two. Um, and there are several uh, ways of looking at the family history and kind of making a diagnosis, but the definitive diagnosis is going to be looking at your actual DNA and cells to kind of see if you carry it. I, don't, I can't remember if this has been put up here, but here are some of the common um, Lynch-associated uh, cancer. So colon cancer, if all of us in the room have a 5 to 6 percent lifetime risk of developing colon cancer, but if you have Lynch syndrome, that's almost an 80 percent risk. And look at the age. 44 is the average age for colon cancer diagnosis in Lynch syndrome. Generally in the normal population, it's in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Same thing with endometrial cancer, 2 to 3 percent population risk, but if you have Lynch syndrome, 20 to 60 percent, an average age of 46. Um, my youngest endometrial cancer patient with Lynch syndrome was 25, okay? My youngest um, endometrial cancer patient without Lynch syndrome was 18, um, and that was because of obesity. Um, we're looking at stomach cancer, ovarian cancer. Uh, we don't think about ovarian cancer and Lynch syndrome a lot, but it's still pretty high, okay? And again, the average age younger. So what are the data in um, gynecologic oncology? Okay, so if you look at women in our populations who have, um, meet the, the guidelines for having Lynch syndrome, you know, 12% of women under 45 with endometrial cancer will have Lynch syndrome versus, again, 2 to 3% of the population with endometrial cancer. And about 14% of women who have both uterine cancer and endometrial cancer will have Lynch syndrome. Women under 50, um, looking at a little wider group, about 9% to ha have mutations. The hard part is there's no real way to kind of screen everybody, I'm sorry, to define who to screen for Lynch syndrome because any cutoffs, whether you use a family history of a cancer or an age cutoff, you're going to miss some of the women with Lynch syndrome. Um, and, and so what do we do? We have um, folks that have endometrial cancer, okay, so we want to know if their cancer was caused by gen genetic mutation. So the first thing we can do is actually look at the tumor, okay. We look to see if it pr has the proteins that are encoded by these genes. And so it's just looking at a marker. Okay, and that's a screening test. Okay, there's another way of looking at it, which looks at the DNA. But so we're just looking at the tumor to see if it has it. If the tumor shows signs of being Lynch syndrome, then the next step is to look at the patient's blood, okay, to see if those abnormal um, genes are elsewhere and they inherited it, or did it just happen by chance in the cancer? Um, 
And the issue is, you know, these things are kind of expensive, not tremendously expensive, but should you do it on just the high-risk women? By high-risk, I mean women under 50, or women with a family history of a Lynch syndrome, or should you do it on everybody? And we um, looked at this at my institution and just looked at high-risk women alone, and we could not find a way to cut off things and not miss women with a genetic syndrome. And so, at least at our institution, and this is happening nationwide, um, people with colon cancer and endometrial cancer, their tumors are actually all being tested. This is not universal, and we only started changing this um, this past year. And so all of my endometrial cancer patients automatically are getting screened for Lynch syndrome based on their tumor. Um, and again, this is new. Um, this is not universal, but it's something for all of you, if you're thinking, well, gosh, I got a my mom had colon cancer, I have endometrial cancer, something to definitely talk to your doctor about, okay? Now, even if your tumor expresses or doesn't express these protein, um, it's not for sure that you have the syndrome. You need to go to genetic testing and counseling as the next step. And the, the benefits of knowing this, obviously, is this provides risk information not only for you and other cancers you might develop if you carry this Lynch syndrome, but also for family members. And who wouldn't want to prevent cancer? I would love to be out of a job. I'd, I'd find something else to do um, if we managed to prevent all cases of endometrial cancer, and that would be fine with me. Um, the limitations of genetic testing in general is that, and I, this is out of the scope of this talk, is that we can't just go around and test everybody's blood for every genetic mutation under the sun. Um, we have to do it much more intelligently. Um, and so, the, again, this is just a, the, the benefits and limitations. So if we find a family that has Lynch syndrome, what can we do? Screening, we can talk about. We can talk about chemo prevention, because again, it's always better not to get cancer than to get cancer. And then along the lines of chemo prevention, chemo just meaning any drug to prevent cancer versus surgery, surgical risk reduction. If we take out the uterus and the ovaries, you almost 100% can't develop those cancers. But of course, we don't want to whip out everybody's ovaries and uterus at 20. I mean, there's some downside to that um, a little bit. Okay, so these are the cancer screening recommendations for um, families with Lynch syndrome. So colons, um, you know, most of us are on the 10-year program. You get a colonoscopy at 50, and if it looks okay, then you get one every 10 years. Unfortunately, if you have Lynch syndrome, you're on the one to two-year plan for a colonoscopy. Huh, that's a lot of fun. Um, but it's more fun than getting cancer, okay, and trying to pick something up early. Um, so you do that about two to five years before the earliest diagnosis. Stomach cancer, high risk for stomach cancer, so you do a scope from the top to look inside the stomach. Um, you're higher risk for bladder cancer, so you do a urinalysis. Endometrial cancer, again, not really conducive to screening, not because we can't do endometrial biopsies on everyone, but most women present pretty early with symptoms, and so there's not really a lot of added benefit to doing screening. Um, and ovarian cancer screening, again, a talk in and of itself about why we don't have good screening for that. Um, oral contraceptive pills. Um, are the greatest invention since sliced bread, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and not because they prevent pregnancy, although that is an added bonus. Um, in my view, the biggest thing and the unheralded um, advantage about birth control pills is prevention of cancer. If you take them for five years, they decrease your ovarian cancer risk in half, and they also decrease your uterine cancer risk. And again, it's just not something that is discussed very much. So for those of you that have, um, you know, younger women in your family, for example, daughters, um, this is something to certainly talk with them about. Aspirin, um, still not enough data to recommend this primarily, but aspirin reduces colon cancer risk, also some data on reducing breast cancer risk. And so that's something, if there are no contraindications in your family about using aspirin, may be something to do to present, prevent colon cancer. Okay, and now for something completely different, if there are any Monty Python fans out there. Um, so. Obesity. I know you've heard a lot about it and you're sick of it, I'm sure. Um, but the question is, how did America change so drastically and so quickly? Um, I love the far side. And again, I've already admitted this is me. Um, I really like candy. Um, so you guys, have everyone seen these slides before? Where the map of the US? Yes? No? Okay. They come up a lot. And um, I know it is election week coming up, and I know we're in DC. And I know that there's a big debate about red versus blue, but I'm just going to go out there and say you want to be a blue state, okay? So here's why. So this is in 1985, so not that long ago. Most of us can remember 1985. And so um, these light blue states have under 10% rate of obesity. These darker blue states have 10 to 14%. And we're going to go in five-year increments here, okay? Five years later, you can see we now are really moving to this darker blue. 
Five years later, now we have a new color in here, okay? So now we have a new category for 15 to 19 percent obesity rate. 2000, only five years later, we again have another new color. Oh, shoot. Um, and I didn't swear. I was just, I'm on tape. Okay. Um, I get bleeped out a lot at home. Um, so so uh, this is over 20%. Look at Colorado. That's my alma mater. I guess not alma mater. That's where I was born. Um, so they are still at 10 to 14%, but everybody else, we've got it over 20%. And this is 2000, so less than 13 years ago. 2005, we have not one, but two new colors now, okay? So we have the over 30% obesity rate here, West Virginia and the Deep South, and then the rest of the South is in the 25 to 29%, okay? It's amazing, amazing how much things have changed, okay? So here are the three five-year maps, and I didn't even go back to 1985. 1990, 95, 2005, and if I had the, the updated data, it would be even worse. We have a, another new color. Okay, so beginning at age 25, we gain a pound to a pound and a half per year, okay? Looking at very, very recent data just in the last five years, where we're seeing the greatest increase in obesity is not in the BMI over 30, and to put it in perspective, to have a BMI over 30, which is considered obese, is really just being about 50 pounds overweight um, for a woman. To be morbidly obese, to have a BMI of 40 or above, it's about 100 pounds extra weight, and to be what's called super obese or BMI over 50 um, is about uh, 200 pounds, okay? So look at the, the rate of increase. The regular obese rate has just gone up 24% versus 52% versus 75%, okay? So we're really seeing gains in the highest rate, and we're seeing this at very, very young ages, okay? And the problem, and it's not, I'm not talking about people needing to be model thin. We're talking about all of the things that come along with obesity, and it's all of these chronic diseases. We've got stroke, gallbladder, diabetes, hypertension, sleep apnea, asthma. And with all of these metabolic diseases, we're looking at people having premature death. We are the first generation that is not going to live longer than our parents' generation, and it's because of obesity. Okay, we've already heard the prevalence of these conditions. Sleep apnea. We have in the last five years at my hospital, every single person going to surgery has to be screened for sleep apnea. Um, we have something called a STOP BANG. They love these acronyms. I don't, don't ask me what it stands for. But essentially, you measure a folks' neck, ask them about uh, uh, snoring and things like that. And everybody that fails, which is um, most of my patients fail the STOP BANG, and they have to get a sleep study before going to surgery because of the risk of getting narcotics and not being able to uh, wake up very well. Okay, so again, I don't, then the other ones we've already talked about, but look at the cancer rate. So these are the three big obesity-related cancers. Breast cancer, uterine cancer, and colon cancer, both, all three very common, and the obesity rate, 11% rate of those diseases. So obesity is overtaking tobacco as the leading cause of cancer death, okay? Sorry. I got to liven it up a little bit here. All right. So we already talked about this. Cancer is the second leading cause of death in the developed world. Uh, obesity is really linked to multiple cancer types, and 40% of endometrial cancer is due to obesity. If we manage to keep people within, uh, you know, a BMI of 25 to 30, which is, you know, overweight but not obese, we would prevent a third of all of our cancer deaths. Okay? Just think about that. Um, and we're just not focusing enough on prevention. And endometrial cancer, uterine cancer, is the most um, disproportionately um, so the relative risk of death with uterine cancer is sixfold um, if you're obese. Now, again, we already talked about this. It's not the endometrial cancer that's going to get you, oh, usually. Um, heart disease. Okay, one in two women with heart disease, one in three for diabetes. Endometrial cancer, one in 33. Breast cancer, one in eight. Okay. And unfortunately, again, if you look at survival with early endometrial cancer, the heavier you are, so that BMI of 40 group, um, you start off with 100% of the women alive, and then as time goes on, you drop down, okay? Um, and you can see this is the BMI of 40 group, so those um, folks are dying earlier than the, their counterparts that are a little smaller. And again, most women with endometrial cancer are going to die of cardiovascular disease. In the first couple years after diagnosis, most of the deaths are due to endometrial cancer because those are the ones that are aggressive. Cancer tends to come back relatively quickly if it's going to come back. But once you're through the risk of your disease, 
then look what happens. You're really, this is your risk of dying of cardiovascular disease. A um, couple other things. It's not just about um, preventing heart disease and diabetes and things like that. It's also about quality of life, okay? And what's more important than quality of life? It's no point being alive if you can't do the things you want to do. Okay? And so we've shown in multiple different kinds of cancer that lifestyle changes and primarily physical activity, weight loss, uh, and diet improve quality of life in survivor. And this is across multiple different kinds of cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, endometrial cancer. Um, and the majority of endometrial cancer survivors don't make a lot of changes in their lifestyle. And part of that is because we need better support for it. You know, physicians up until now have not been reimbursed for doing preventive care. We're, we're paid by operating. We're paid by doing treatments, and that's not optimal. We really need to do a better job um, in that. And we need more help. We need nutritionists. <laughs> I'm going to give you some diet advice, but let's be honest, I'm not the best person to do that. Um, and so we really need nutritionists. We need exercise physiology folks. Um, so we need a lot of other people to help us in this journey. So I, I like the Muppets too. Um, so the American Cancer Society in 2006 had some guidelines for cancer survivorship that they recommended. They recommended 150 minutes a week of moderate to visit, uh, vigorous physical activity, five servings of fruits and vegetables, and no smoking. And actually smoking is something we as, as gynecologic cancer does pretty well with. Okay, um, I don't want to advertise this, but women who smoke actually get less uterine cancer. We keep that kind of under the rug, okay, because um, I don't recommend it as a, a prevention tool. Okay, so obesity treatment, goals of treatment, again, improved quality of life, decreased cancer recurrence, and decreased medical complications of obesity. So all good goals, okay? So what are our options? We've got diet, we've got exercise. I'm gonna mention a little bit about bariatric surgery. I am not gonna talk about any of the drug treatments. Um, I just, there are too many of them and they all kinda come and go very quickly. And so questions I want you guys to think about as we go through this is, has your physician discussed any of this with you? I, I hope they have. Um, and the other question is, do you think we should, as UN oncologists, talk about this with you? Um, because I think we, we're probably not doing a, a great. Um, so diet and exercise work, except for the fact that they don't, okay? And the reason they don't work is that it's really hard. It's really hard to make lifestyle changes, and it's really hard um, to do these things. If, if any of you guys have seen The Biggest Loser, uh, it's a little unrealistic, but it is true, okay? If you have someone dedicated, gosh, I'd love to have a personal trainer and I'd love to have someone exactly dictating what I got to eat, that'd be awesome. Um, uh, unfortunately, it's up to me, um, which is a little more difficult. So the diet options are overwhelming. In preparation for this, I went online um, last night and just for the, hell, the heck of it, um, I typed. <laughs> I typed in, you know, best diet and all of this stuff, and it, it'd be amazing at what comes up. And so, you know, you've got your low-fat proponents, you've got your low-carbohydrate proponents, you've got your vegetarian, vegan proponents. And so there are lots of diet options, but which one is best? Is it the paleo? Is it the Atkins? Is it the Weight Watchers? I mean, gosh, you can even find an all-chocolate diet, um, which I, I think is not good, but I might try it out anyway. Um, so generally, I have a few rules for diet changes, and these are, you know, not um, data-driven. But regardless, it has to be a sustainable lifestyle change, okay? You can't do, you can do anything for a day or two, but it has to be something you can do lifelong. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to do it. The whole family has to buy into the change. Just like if someone is a smoker and their partner doesn't quit smoking, there's no way that they're going to be able to do that. And so this is something that the whole family um, needs to adopt. Bottom line is we need to avoid processed foods. I love Twinkies, I'm glad they came back on the market, um, but we really, it's not, not a good thing to eat. And we need to focus on vegetables in addition to everything else we eat, okay? It's not replacing, it's in addition. And just by adding it in and not working on cutting things out, it will do better. And so, you know, we all love rankings. So uh, when I was doing my Googling yesterday, we had the US News and World Report diet rankings. And actually, I didn't know about half of these diets, so I had to do a little more research. So the DASH diet, which is Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension, was by the National Heart and Lung Institute. It was really focused on preventing hypertension. It's kind of what you think of with a typical diet. Low fat, low salt, lots of vegetables. Then the TLC diet, which is not, what's, what does that usually stand for? I don't know, my, my 14 year old would be able to tell me. But the Learning Channel? No, Tender Loving Care, TLC. Okay, but anyway, this is Therapeutic Lifestyle Change. It was created by the NIH. 
Then the Mayo Clinic has their own diet because the Mayo Clinic does everything different than everybody else. And then there's a the Mediterranean diet, you know, focusing on olive oil, nuts, things like that. Weight Watchers has always had a great diet. And part of Weight Watchers' success is because they give you something to follow. You know, you don't have to think. You can just follow what they tell you to do. Uh, the flexitarian diet is apparently kind of vegetarian, but with some flexibility. Um, I don't know who came up with that. Volumetrics, I have no idea. I don't know what that is, but it was on the list. Um, and I did put the, the, the site. You can go to this site, and then it'll link you into each one. They have recipes. It's actually, um, I, I took about, <laughs> I wasted about 30 minutes yesterday looking at all that, but it's, it's got some good things on it. So the U.S. dietary guidelines, the top tips are building a healthy plate. And so make half of every plate, and we should be using smaller plates, by the way, uh, every plate half fruits and vegetables. Majority of your grains should be whole grains and vary the protein choices. We should all cut back on solid fats and added sugars. Um, I know no one here is probably doing this, but soda, it's liquid candy. Okay? And so that's what I tell my kids, and they're sick of hearing it, but, you know, you don't get to have liquid candy. Um, unless that's your dessert. Um, and the key thing is eating the right amount of calories to you. Enjoy your food, but eat less of it. Cook more often at home, okay? And keep track of what you eat. So changing gear, we've talked about diet a little bit, now let's talk about exercise. So all adults should avoid inactivity. Some physical activity, whatever it is, is better than none, okay? Adults who participate in any amount of physical activity gain health benefits. And it, it is a dose response curve. So the more you do, the better. Until you get to that marathon running thing, that's bad. Um, that, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Um, so the, the recommendations are, as we talked about, 150 minutes of uh, vigorous um, to moderate, or 75 if you're going to be really vigorous and intense. And then the more you do, the better. The other thing to add in there is not just aerobic and walking, but we really need to do some strength training. And that's important, especially for women, because we're more at risk for osteoporosis after menopause. So not only do you need aerobic changes, but you need strength training. Building up your muscles also increases your metabolic rate, which is good um, in general. Oh, and this super tracker thing down there is a, a nice website that if you guys can go on, you can track what you're doing. It can tell you how many calories you do, how much you should use. So again, there are a lot of nice tools out on the internet that you can get on, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, we have been slow to get on this in medicine, okay, but there is a study, which you guys wouldn't have heard about because it's for ovarian cancer, but so it's looking at diet and exercise to prevent cancer recurrence. So women with ovarian cancer, this study is looking at adding in um, a coached arm. So the coached arm gets intensive calls. They are instructed to do 4,000 extra steps as well as six servings of fruits and vegetables and dietary fat under 20%. So the intensive group gets all of this intervention um, and guidance on how to do it. The control group gets um, written instructions but no intensive coaching. And, and it's ongoing now, and so I don't have actual data to report, but I do have anecdotes. I have two patients on it after three months. The one that's on the intensive side loves to talk to her coach who's out at Arizona. She's lost um, six pounds in three months, and more importantly, she's lost 10 centimeters off her waist. And she just feels great. She bought a juicer. Um, she says you can grind up anything green, and it's good. I, I'm not sure about that. Um, but then the, the woman that's on the normal side actually gained three pounds. So I really think there's something to it, but you need support to get it done. Um, it's too early to tell whether this is going to impact cancer, but it's definitely impacting quality of life and just general healthiness, which I think is good. Um, so primary prevention, I know we've got NED playing tonight, um, but obviously we would rather have prevention rather than the cure. All right. So bariatric surgery, who has heard anything about bariatric surgery? Everybody? Okay. So this has been a new kid on the block, okay? So in 1990, there were only 16,000 bariatric surgery in the U.S. And now in 2008, which is the last day, uh, year I could find numbers for, 220,000. To put that in perspective, there are about 500,000 to 600,000 hysterectomies a year. So this is, and which is the most common operation in women. So it is a really, really common indication. Uh, and what it is is for women that are, or men too, um, that are morbidly obese, they fail diet and exercise, and they have some health problems related to their obesity. Um, and why do we talk about this? We actually tried to put forth a prevention trial looking at bariatric surgery. Um, we haven't gotten anybody to fund it. Um, but if you look retrospectively at folks who have undergone bariatric surgery, we looked at about 5,000 women at UVA, about 1,500 of them had had bariatric surgery, and about 3,500 were obese without bariatric surgery. And we found fewer cancers in the bariatric patients, 
But the bariatric patients that had cancer, the most of them had cancer before their surgery, and they were very, very young when they had cancer. So 42 versus 57, and most of the cancer was before the bariatric surgery. There's been a large Swedish study also looking at the impact of bariatric surgery, and they had decreased cancer incidence as well as mortality from cancers. And so these studies support potentially that losing weight and bariatric surgery is a drastic but very effective way of losing weight. And so how do we do bariatric surgery? There are three kind of main ways. So the, and we is, is the royal we, like when we have to do something at home, we are going to mow the lawn. Um, my, AKA my husband's gonna mow the lawn. Um, so we do bariatric surgery, it'd be the bariatric surgeon. So we've got a band here, okay? And essentially that closes up so that you can only fit about three tablespoons of food into the stomach at any one time. And so it restricts what you can do. So that's a restrictive procedure. The sleeve gastrectomy is essentially you take off this part of the stomach. So again, it leaves you a much smaller stomach so you don't have a reservoir where you can eat a lot. And then the, the traditional one is a combination of making the stomach smaller as well as bypassing this part of the, the bowel so that you have both a restriction and a malabsorption so you don't absorb the calories as efficiently. And yeah, it's, it's drastic, um, but it works. Um, 40 to 60% of excess weight lost at three to five years and resolution of diabetes, hypertension in 60 to 90%. Now my personal bias is that this is drastic. You know, I think diet and exercise would be better, but for some um, folks, this is very, very effective. So in conclusion, we cannot control our genes uh, as of yet, um, but we can take steps to under understand our genetic risk and what can we do differently. Um, we can try and find cancer early or prevent cancer if an inherited risk is found in the family. Um, we also can't control our environment, but we can react, control how we react to our environment. And so we can improve our nutrition, we can improve our physical activity. And so, um, I'm from the UVA, so of course you have to have a quote from Thomas Jefferson. If you give any talk, it's a requirement. Um, so this is from Thomas Jefferson. Give about two hours every day to exercise, for health must not be sacrificed to learning. A strong body makes the mind strong. So thank you very much. <laughs>